All right, you got your Bibles? Let me see those, please. Bibles up. Okay, electronic Bibles. Okay, well done. <laughs> Y'all be scared to the front row, I can see. It's all right. I want to deal with an unpopular subject today. It's all about obedience. How many was ever told when you were growing up, you were told to do something, you asked why, and the response came back curtly, because I said so? How many was ever told that? How many was never told that? It was never told because I said so. Listen, that's great training for, for following Jesus. It, it really is. Because when the Lord says, give them five bucks, or tell them this phrase, or speak this one word, or allow them to cut in line, or all this stuff, right? And the first initial reaction that typically comes up in the hearts and minds of people is, well, why, Lord? I mean, if you explain it to me and cause me to understand the plan, then I'll be happy to participate. And God's like, ain't enough time in the world for you to understand, nor enough intelligence between your ears. All I'm asking you to do is do what I'm saying to do. So we need to have that quick-witted response that if the Lord says jump, we go, yep. I mean, there's not a, there's not, now, Lord, did you really want me to jump in church or while I'm in line here at Qdoba or did you, did you, it doesn't matter, right? So if he can't trust you to jump, how in the world are you going to trust you to speak Lay hands, prophesy, pray. You get where I'm at? So despise not the day of small beginnings. We, we've been doing afterglow, and I can just see sometimes the war between your ears. Because you're thinking, is that God? Is that God? That's not God. Is that God? I'm not sure. That, should I say that? No, I don't know if I should. Somebody already said something. Close. I don't know if I should do that. And so you're back and forth, back and forth. Take a risk. I've never seen anybody offer a question or a suggestion or whatnot, and everybody start going, ah, oh, my God, did you really say that? Nobody's ever done that. Everybody is very amenable. Everybody is very um, open because we all want to learn to be on the same page. And how is that ever going to happen if we don't ask questions? Make sense? I believe that the most important issue in every life under the sound of my voice today is obedience. Every problem that we're facing in some way is related to the issue of obedience. Every solution in our life is connected to obedience. See, obedience opens us up to the infinite wisdom of God. You don't have to know all the ins and outs like we just discussed. All we have to know is that God is never going to require something of us that, A, we're incapable of doing, or, B, that's going to be unfruitful. There's only one thing that God backs up. Okay, two. The Word and obedience. I'm convinced that when somebody does something that they believe in their heart was God, even when it wasn't God, because they believed it was, God will honor it in them. Did you catch that? If you're driving down the road and you don't know it, but the person with the sign is the biggest drug dealer in the state of Oklahoma. And you feel compelled to give him 10 bucks. Not knowing he's going to flip that 10 bucks into drugs and try to kill people with it. But because your heart was, I, I really believe that if I would do this, God would, would honor that. And your heart was to please God in it. 
I believe that $10 bill will burn a hole in the bottom of his bag and he'll lose all the money because you did what you believe was God even when God didn't tell you to do that. Am I making sense to anybody? God, God will honor your heart towards him. The Bible tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than religious activities. Obedience is what opens up the resources of heaven when nothing else will. How many have heard the scripture? He who is faithful with little will be faithful with. Isn't it crazy? Christians want to say, God, if you'd just give me a million bucks, I'd tear this world up for Jesus. He's like, what'd you do with a hundred I gave you last week? Huh? Lord, if you just give me a, a gazillion dollars. <laughs> I gave you a bicycle. Hey, you know what that? You think I'm being facetious, and I, I, I don't know how much that is. I mean, he who's faithful with little will be faithful with much. I mean, before I put my, my son behind the wheel of a car, I put him on a tractor. Then I put him on a four-wheeler. Then I put him on a zero turn. And when I realized he had some control of the throttle and would exercise that, now I felt a little bit better, a little bit better about putting his, his foot on the gas pedal. of a, You see what I'm saying? But if he's never controlled anything, when, see, I learned because when he was a kid, Cameron and I took him out on the boat. Little sportster speedboat, five seater, right? And so Cameron and I are displaying some, you know, hey, look at what it'll do. Oh, I'll give it a little bit more. Oh, yeah, they give it a little bit more. All right, back it off. And so we're demonstrating for Nick, right? So we say, hey, Nick, you want to try this? Yep. All right, son, here's the, here's the steering wheel. Put both hands, and here's the throttle. He just looked right at me and went, And then, while he had a hand on the wheel, was looking at me instead of where he was going. I said, son, look, that's land. This is water. That's land. And I think that's how God is sometimes with people in ministry. Lord, I just want to do, I just want to be involved in ministry. You see what I'm saying? And God is looking for temperance. He's looking for wisdom. He's looking for, for uh, uh, self-control. He's looking for obedience to what he says. And watch this. When we have a preference, I'm just going to say it like this. When, when you know some stuff going on in the church and you want to preach a message so bad and just lie about it, slap them all silly, and God says, that's, A, hey, number one, that ain't me. Even though you might be using the word, I'm not telling you to use that in this instance. And I'm not telling you to go after people. I'm not telling you to make people feel bad. I'm not telling you to knock them upside the head. you got to love people. you got to treat people the same way I did you, son, when you was acting a fool. But a lot of people in ministry, just line them up, God. Line them up, right? And God is looking for that self-control that we will do what we know is in his heart that he wants done instead of what we want to do and call it God. So to understand the power that comes in obedience, there's three things we got to know. Number one, obedience is the designed relationship of God and man. God never, des God never designed us to act alone. You know what disturbs me? Everybody who thinks that they're called to ministry got to go solo. And I'm like, what? What? Everybody who says, man, I just, I just want to be used to God and I just got to step out on my own. No, you need to step out in the house. You do. You, you need to let your, your, your ministry prowess be seen and observed and corrected while you're in the house so that you don't go out and act a fool and misrepresent Jesus and the house and your mentors. You don't hear nothing I'm saying. But, but there's always this, well, I just gotta, I just gotta launch, so I gotta I gotta do my own thing. Yeah. 
God built the church to be go cohesive and to function as a unit. And somehow we have so misunderstood and misrepresented what God said about his own body and his own house that from within the house we're trying to divide and the enemy's sitting on the sidelines going, yeah, do it. He's not even having to infiltrate because our mindset is we, we got to splinter off. And Don't you know that two can get the job done faster and better than one and three better than two? And 10, better than, y'all hearing anything I'm saying? So if, if we would learn how to function together, and, and the way we do that is we first have to learn how to be obedient to God. Because if I'm not obedient to God directly, I will not be obedient to the system he's instituted in his, in his fellowship called the house. Obedience is key. You want to know where most marriage strife comes from? jockeying for position of who's right and who's in charge it is i'm serious i mean if you if you boil down all the problems down to the the nuts and bolts well, i would follow him if he would just be the leader that god's called him to be and the men they're like, Adam, God, this woman you got, I was doing fine until she showed. Huh? So here God's put what God has joined together, right? Let no man tear apart. That means you and your spouse, too. You don't, you don't be ripping up what he placed together because he knew you'd be better together than you would be apart. And you were all about that until the honeymoon was over. Watch this. This is how people are in church. Woo! Found me a church. Glory! This is a wonderful place. I'm at home. This is the place I'm supposed to be. And all of a sudden, we get six months in. And they're told, don't do this. Don't do that. Quit acting a fool. Don't say it like that. <laughs> I ain't staying here. I'm going down the road. They're going to let me. Hey, they're going to let me be me. Listen, God is letting you be you that he made, not the you that went rogue. Obedience is the key. How many of you parents just tell your kids, just be you? You want to slam the door? You want to leave all the lights on all 24? Just leave them on? You want to turn the, the, the refrigerator off and turn the AC in the house down to 32 degrees? That's okay. Just You just be No. Mm. Mm. No. If we let them do what they wanted to do, they'd live off lollipops, Cheetos, and cereal. Obedience is key. And you parents that aren't making your kids obey, you the ones need to be on the front row. There's a song we used to sing, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. You can rewrite that for the house. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to stay in mom and dad's good graces than to trust and obey. It's good training for the house of God. It's good training for, for a relationship with Jesus. God built obedience as a component to a loving, functioning relationship. But everybody wants to be rogue. Lucifer had the best job. He was the worship leader for God. The presence that we sometimes just get shavings of on earth, he had in its fullness. Can you imagine Satan singing, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. For those that have ever truly been in the presence of God, it's like the presence forces you to the floor. It's like you weigh 5,000 pounds. It's like you're kissing carpet and you don't know why. It's, 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 this, it's this immediate urge that I cannot stand up. Why? Because the presence is so thick. 
our bodies are not capable of handling the glory and the weighted presence of God. Yet Lucifer had it every day. And he gave it up to do what? To separate, because I can do better on my own. I can do that job. I got you. I'll be back. I'm going to take over. God made obedience the cohesive component that keeps God with man and man with God. We're designed to work in relationship with him. Can you imagine if you got this beautiful car and it has your dream motor in it? There's no transmission. So you sit in the driveway, you pump that gas, you listen to that turbo. Man, I got power. Woo! Got power. Ain't going nowhere. But you got power. God has all power. But he loves us so much that he made an intricate connection with you and I so that we're the transmission that causes his power to go where it needs to go. And when we say, I don't know about that Joel cat, this no excuses stuff, it's kind of weird, a little obnoxious. I think I was doing better just me and God before I ever started going, so I think I'm just going to disconnect I'm not saying you've got to be a part of this house to be connected to God, but I'm saying if you're willing to disconnect from any house, that's the first step in disconnecting from God. Your motor may be running. You might have a fresh oil change, fresh oil filter, air filter, plugs, platinum, new coils, octane boost, that turbo is freshly oiled. And it'll make that car rock in the driveway. I can see you changing the world from your driveway. Psalm 119, verse 99. Psalm 119, verse 99. God truly created you and I to benefit from his resources. Psalms in the middle of the book. I have better understanding, the Bible says, and deeper insight than all my teachers because your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged because I keep your precepts by hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying them. People pride themselves, well, I know all the Ten Commandments. How many are you keeping? I know the Bible forwards and backwards. Are you doing anything it says? I love it when people tell me, oh, I love God. Me and God are tight. Really? Where are you going to church at? Well, I ain't been in a minute, so I've learned. Okay, define your minute. A week, a month, a year, a decade? What do you mean is a minute? The last time I asked, it was a decade. And I say, but me and God, we're, we're tight, really. When you told him you refused to go to his house, what did he say back? That's like you calling into work and saying, I ain't showing up, but bless God, there better be a paycheck in my bell box and we going to court. Huh? I'm serious. What does God say back? I'm so tired of hearing believers tell me how much they tell God. God don't need your wisdom. God gave you the wisdom you think you got. What did he say back? And when I ask people that, I normally get, 
oh, I'm supposed to listen to? Yes. That's 75% of it. 25% is you getting off the, the praise and the, and the loving on him and giving him petitions and thanking him. And The 75% is when you sit with a pad and pen. All right, I'm ready. You want to know why a lot of people have trouble with that? And they, they manipulate people that don't know better. People that have never heard God in their life will come to you and say, hey, uh, God, God told me that you had a couple hundred bucks for me, and I'm just, I'm just obeying God. You think that's funny. You think that's funny. I've known of people that were ministers that came up to somebody and said, listen, God told me you were supposed to get married. So I'm just telling you right now so you can get your mind wrapped around it. This, this is what God said. And it's happened many times because the one he's talking to didn't have any better relationship with God than he did. Y'all catch anything I'm saying? So just because somebody says God said don't mean God said it. And that's why in this house, especially if I don't know you or I don't have a great relationship with you or I don't have a good relationship with you, you hear what I'm saying? that I have a responsibility to see to it that all this thus saith the Lord stuff that's not thus saith the Lord gets snuffed out. You know how I do that? I make sure that if you have a word for somebody, you come tell me that you got a word for them, or you tell somebody else that, 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 that we have faith in the house, especially in prayer. That'd be mom and dad. That'd be the Cranmers, you know, th- that kind of thing, where you come to them and say, Rachel, and, and, and say, listen, I, I, got a wor- I got a word for Nancy, but I, I really want this weighed. So, Nancy, I believe I hear the Lord saying blah, 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 blah. And you go, whoa, what if it's a word from God? Then it's witnessed, it's confirmed, it's celebrated. What if it's not? Then you're probably going to get thanked. Hey, man, I really appreciate you stepping out because I know that was a gutsy thing to do. I really appreciate you stepping out. And so as soon as that person walks off, now, Nancy, you know that really wasn't the Lord. <laughs> so I'm just going to warn you right now, chop that one off, cast that down. We'll deal with it later. And then... We'll go deal with that. I'm not trying to shame anybody, but hey, where, 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 do you, where did you get that? How did you, how did you, how did you sense that was the Lord? And let's find out what's going on here. I, I'm not trying to beat nobody down and embarrass anybody, but we have a responsibility. That's why I put my son, remember, on a tractor, on a four-wheeler, on a zero turn, and then a car. Every one of us, it's like everybody wants to exempt themselves. I don't have to do that small stuff. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. There's not any of you that goes to work, makes an income without first getting up and part, putting your pants. It's the small stuff. Some of you still haven't learned to buckle a belt, but that's a whole other issue. I've just said, yeah, everybody starts. Come on. It's the small stuff that makes the world go around. It's the small stuff that makes ministry happen. It's the small stuff that causes relationships to be solid. So many people think, if I just get married, glory to God. Get God's hand of blessing upon the relationship. Hallelujah. So they get that. And then the marriage starts falling apart. Why? Because it's the little things. It's not the ceremony. It's not how big the reception was. It's the little things. Do you call them? Do you give them love notes? Do you buy them gifts? Do you tell them constantly how much you love them? Do you appreciate what they do? Are you throwing respect? Are you throwing disrespect? It's the little things. You can't get away from how essential obedience is. Genesis 2, verse 16. That's the very first book of the Bible. Trying to help you all out. God gave Adam a command. He said, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. What was the one thing that wreaked havoc in Adam's life? I like uh, Miles Monroe. Anybody heard of Miles Monroe? Anybody ever listen to Miles Monroe? Who's never heard of Miles Monroe? (laughs) 
I heard him minister one time, and he said, God created Adam first. And he took from his side a rib, fashioned a woman. So God created, we like to throw the term around, the head. But he created us to be the protector and the visionary. But that woman is our transmission. You can have all the vision in the world, but if you ain't going nowhere. And he said, the devil understood the authority. Because he went to the woman first. What happened when Eve ate the apple? Huh? What ha- but what happened? Watch this. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. She ate. Nothing happened. But she took it to Adam. When Adam ate, the eyes of their understanding was open. Why? He's the head. Y'all ain't getting this yet. The devil knew if he came to Adam first and Adam shut it down, that's a protection of the woman. So he grabbed the woman more vulnerable first and he knew nothing would happen to her so she could either go, hey, I ate it. Not to look at me. I don't know nothing I didn't know before I ate the apple. I'm just as dumb as I was before. Take this. Because of authority. I don't know what y'all do to me. There's so much more that I'm sharing with you than I have written down. This is great. What has God instructed you to do? You want to know what most of y'all will default to? Well, I'm called to the homeless. I'm called to do this ministry. I'm called to preach. I'm called. What's the last instruction he gave you? How about that one where he elbowed you and said, call so-and-so, they need encouragement. How about the time he, he nudged you and said, you need to call your mate because they're feeling a little down, and you saw that last night, and you ignored it, but you need to address that today. Well, what about on your way home, and you know there ain't no milk in the fridge. You know there ain't. And the humanity of you would just go home over there, I can't believe there ain't no milk up in this fridge. When the Lord already told you, hey, on the way home, hit by Brahms and pick you up not one, not two, but three gallons to be a blessing to the house. Y'all ain't hearing anything. Because y'all think this, y'all think I'm I'm making something out of nothing. I'm not. It's the nothings that we think are nothing that are really somethings in God's economy that cause things not to function and work. Yeah. So sometimes you got a little extra dinero in your pocket and you know you're trying to build a relationship with somebody who, who don't. And so the Lord says, when you go to lunch today, buy their lunch. But you're thinking what else you could be doing with that money and how that would benefit you throughout the week. And so you justify why if you can trust God for the money, then they can trust God for the money. And what you don't understand is God wanted you to spend the money as an act of obedience because he already put something on the inside of them that they were going to share, you, share with you at the table that was going to blow your mind and change your life. You saw it as this big. God saw it as this big. Obedience is key. You cannot get away from obedience. Abraham, key figure in the Old Testament, God told him to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a place that he would show him. He had to do this one thing and one thing only, obey 
God. Hebrews 11, 8 sums it up this way when it says, By faith Abraham obeyed, and when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he was going. Faith is always expressed in obedience. Let me put it another way. Obedience is the expression of faith. Genesis 26, verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What's he saying? Because he was obedient, I'm going to bless him. We come to church over and over and over. I just need to be blessed. You need to pray for me. I came today just so you lay hands on me and pray for me. I need to be blessed. Sometimes I just want to look at you and say, you need to be obedient so you can catch the blessing. Your net is ripped. Bless, bless, bless. Fall straight through, straight through, straight through. Obedience hems up the net so when you're blessed, you catch it. This is why a lot of people come to church and say, I've been trying that Christian stuff and that Jesus stuff for the last 25 years. Ain't nothing changed in my life. No, you still just as disobedient today as you were 25 years ago. You got that right. Trying to blame God when it wasn't God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass that if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, not most of them, not all but one, but all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessings come because of and through obedience. Matthew 15, 8. These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are far away from me. This is why in counseling sessions with, with couples, and I'll say face each other. Say face each other. And I say to the man, confess your love to your wife. I love you. And I look at the wife and I say, confess your love to your husband. I love you too. I already know the problem. People come to church. Love you, Lord. Love you. You peel through all the C notes and find a 20. Love you, Lord. Y'all ain't hearing nothing. You don't attend anything else that has ministry on it until there's a potluck. I don't know why. I just woke up and realized, oh, I should be at church. To yeah, you knew. You knew there was potluck. You knew it was going to be banana pudding, peach cobbler. You knew. Right? See, we don't mind doing stuff if we know that there's an immediate benefit or gratification. This is why so many people don't make it in ministry. This is why so many people don't make it in marriage. Because they had it in their head. It's going to be so glorious when I can say my name is Mrs. So-and-so. It's going to be so great when I can call myself evangelist, pastor, apostle, brother, elder, deacon, parking lot attendant, so-and-so. And then you get it, but there was never anything behind it. There was no function in you there was just a desire to be noticed 
I want to tell you something. I don't mind on occasion being noticed, but I want to be noticed for something I did, not for something I didn't. Number two, the new covenant did not cancel the need for obedience to God. It didn't cancel it. It empowered it. When Jesus came on the scene, he said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one little tittle by no means will pass in the law until it is all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. See, the scribes and the Pharisees, they made the law something that was external. It was a form of godliness. Oh, God, help me right now. That's why, that's why you have churches that look the same. They have the same setup, the same signs, the same songs, the same teaching, the same seating, the same everything. But not all have the same result. Why is that? Because there are many, according to Scripture, not according to Joel, according to Scripture, there will be many in this day that will have a form of godliness. They will have the same sound, the same look, the same, the same spitting, the same uh, potlucks, the same everything. It's all the same. They'll have a form of what looks godly, but there will be no power. Guys, this is, this is in no way building me up. If you want to know the truth, the more I'm talking about this, the heavier it feels. Because I know there's going to be more judgment and more eyeballs and more scrutiny and more everything just because I'm saying this out loud. But the truth of the matter is just because somebody's got a flag, a name badge, or a business card does not make them who God's called them to be. They may be called to be that. That don't make them that because they got a card. Everybody thinks that when you're involved in ministry, it ought to just be boom, instant. No. Listen, the moment you say yes to Jesus and you receive him in your heart, you're eligible at that moment to start telling people about Jesus. Absolutely. And I think it comes with great power because you're an instant testimony to the goodness and greatness of God. But just because you got saved yesterday doesn't mean you need to be doing marriage counseling today. Doesn't mean you need to be doing deliverance today. Doesn't need to be, doesn't mean you need to be teaching about why tongues are important in 2024. Those things will come. But they will come. I don't know about you, but if I go to go to the doctor and I gotta have surgery, I don't want to be his first. Do not. I do not want to be his first. If anybody in my family's got to have any kind of an operation, I, I, I'll make sure I'm there for the doctor. How many of these surgeries, these exact surgeries, have you done? If that number is less than triple digits, next. Serious. And we got people tinkering, toying with, playing with, and experimenting with Ministry and wondering why people are getting maimed, bruised, destroyed, spiritually dead. You guys be praying for me in the weeks ahead. I think there's something germinating in me where I may be doing a series of messages on church hurt. Because the very tool that God created to grow the kingdom is the tool that has been so defamed that nobody will have anything to do with it because it's called church. Jesus did not come to do away with the need for obedience to God. 
In fact, it was because and through his obedience to the Father that caused us to have the new covenant. In Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, did y'all catch that? Did y'all catch that? For by one, didn't say, for by one man and one woe man, y'all didn't hear that at all, for by one man sin entered. See, some of y'all men been straight yourself. Yeah, you, you know, woman, you got to submit. You got, you got to do what I say. That's not what it says. It says you're the head, which means you're going to be responsible for even what you make her do. Because if you force her to act in rebellion and get all upset because, what does the Bible say? Don't, don't cause your kids to become scornful. Don't provoke your children to wrath. I believe that applies to your wife, too. You don't push her and ride her so hard that you drive her into ground. And then, well, this woman you gave me, God, she's not submitting Y'all hear anything I'm saying? You got to be careful with that. Because when you stand before God, it ain't just going to be a justification for your wife. All creation is going to know. What you've been doing at home and in private, even those going to hell going to know. Y'all think you're slick. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Again, that's referring to Adam. So also by one man, capital M, that's Jesus. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Let me put it this way. Righteousness is available to all because of what Jesus did. Salvation is available to those that you know because of what you do. Well, I'm just keeping my relationship, you know, private. That's, that's between me. And, no, it's not. Your relationship with Jesus was never meant to be private only. That's like saying that my relationship with my wife is only meant to be private only. There's certain parts that's private only. But most of it is for the public. And there are parts of your relationship with Jesus that is private. It's between you and him. But most of it is for the masses. Jesus didn't have a private crucifixion with close friends and family only. Jesus had to fully obey the Father. Can you imagine? Jesus did everything, and he got right down to the end, and they're nailing him to the cross. He says, Father, I'm done. Angels come. Boom. He comes up off the cross. There's no pain. He's absolutely restored, but we're damned. Jesus had to fully obey. He couldn't get to the part. It is finished. Can I say this prophetically? There's some of you, in fact, I want to say a lion's share of you in this room that have worked so hard to want to be promoted in God. I'm not talking about in the church. I'm talking about positions in God. You wanted, you wanted God to promote you, and you got all the way to the end, about a breath away from being able to say it's finished and get that promotion, and then you cried out and said, I'm done, and you peeled yourself off that, that, that altar of sacrifice and said, I'm not willing to do that. And then you, as time goes by, you look back and say, man, that's really what I'm called. That's what I need to do. I'm going to do it again. And you go through the same sacrifice all over again, get to that same point, jump off. Go back to that same point, jump off, and you do this. That's why we have the story of Moses going round and mountain, round and mountain, round and mountain, round and mountain. Why? Because he had to have that whole generation die. And there's something in your life that needs yet to die, or it'll continue to have you to short circuit God's plan for your life. You have to be fully obedient. It's great to get a word, it's great to get prophecy. It's great to get encouragement, but if that's all you got, that's going to come to pass because you are fully obedient to do. There is a subtle deception that's creeping into the church that tries to minimize obedience to God. 
Sometimes it's called tolerance. Tolerance. We just got to be tolerant of everybody. Express to me what Jesus will be tolerant of when we stand before him. Please explain that to me. Because whatever he will tolerate there, we can tolerate here. But whatever he won't tolerate there, we should not tolerate here. Well, you just need to get off your religious high horse. Jesus loves everybody. He does. He loves all the ones screaming in hell right now. They just didn't love him back. Well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. No, we're not. Show me your adoption papers. Show me your adoption papers. No, we're not. And we have to be okay saying that. We have to be okay saying what Jesus said and what Jesus says. You know how many times I've second-guessed myself before I released the word because I thought, Lord, I'm a little blunt, but that's brutal. Sometimes a brutal word comes because we're so insulated of all the layers of people saying, oh, you're okay just the way you got Jesus understands. He knows. Yeah, he knows. He knows you're reprobate. He knows you're, you're absolutely working against him. He knows that you're hardened in your heart. He knows that you're bent against. He kno- yes, he knows. But we just need to have tolerance. I agree. We need to have tolerance for what the word of God says. We need to have an appetite to receive what God says. We need to have an appetite and an opinion that is in line with thus saith the Lord. Well, now you're just being religious. If there weren't any power and signs following, you might have an argument. It's the power of the gospel that sets people free. Watch this. If you can say the prayer and live life as though you never did, then you didn't experience power. Let me say that again. If you can say the prayer and live your life as though you never said it, you didn't experience power. That's That's the will of man to put God's approval on what God never approved. So sometimes they say tolerance, and other times deception hides in messages of legalism. But the essence of the error sounds something like this. You have been born again. You are a child of God. There is no condemnation to God's children. And all of that is true. But here's where the error starts. Therefore, it doesn't matter what you do or what your preferences are. God understands and you'll be fine. Just keep asking God to forgive you and one day you'll be in heaven and it will all work out. In the meantime, don't feel too bad about all the sin in your life because God knows you're trying. See, the funny thing is most of you at some point in time have lived that. And you wondered why guilt and shame and embarrassment was always a part of the mixture of your life. Because it found sinful soil to grow in. Moving on. Number three, heaven is going to be a place of complete obedience. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Now, when all things were made subject to him, the Son himself will also subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Everything, including Christ himself, will be subject to the Father. 
And when the universe is restored to its proper order, it culminates with God being all in all. If you really want to experience joy and happiness in your Christian walk, it will not be there absent obedience to God. It will be there because of the presence of obedience to God. If, if obeying God is not something you want to do, then heaven is no place for you. I just hear some of y'all, I came to be encouraged today. I, I just, I was down. I need to be lifted up. And That's like somebody being malnourished and they're mad because you didn't hand them another Twinkie. <laughs> you need some broccoli. You need Brussels sprouts. The theme of obedience runs all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. And any gospel that exempts people from obeying God fully is a false gospel. I'll say that one more time. Any gospel that exempts people from obeying God fully is a false gospel. So the question, what does obedience look like to God? I believe that he sees disobedience as equivalence to hate, disrespect, offense, and mistrust of who he is. Conversely, he sees obedience as love, sacrifice, a true desire for him, an undying trust of him. I've mapped this out a number of ways in my head as to how to bring this to culmination. And again, I think when I say what is it that God has instructed you to do that you have intentionally justified, omitted, conveniently forgotten, or ignored? And most of us will run to, well, I, I should be on the street preaching, and I should be in the prisons, and I should be this, and I should be that. That's the big stuff. I'm really talking about what's the last thing he told you to do? To express your love for somebody, to, to offer a prayer for somebody, to, to encourage somebody, to, to do what's in your hand or within your bailiwick or your skill set to offer somebody. I know this seems really like a small thing, but it wasn't to me. I know Royce has been recovering from major surgery. In fact, this is the first time I haven't seen him in a brace since then. And I walked in. I was looking for somebody who would just be available to help me cut all of those little poster cards. There's a bunch of them, about 150 of them. And the, and, the, and the little blade that we have only cuts one at a time. Do the math. That's 150 slices. And I knew he was sitting there enjoying his cup of coffee, and I knew he probably was in pain. But I just threw up a balloon and said, would you mind cutting this? <laughs> Bring it over here. In pain, trying to relax, trying to soak up AC, and I bring him 150 poster cards that, by the way, I went in during worship, and he was still trying to finish them. If we had that kind of willingness when God asked us to do some menial, menial, simple task, imagine what ministry would look like today. 
It's like we pass on all the small things thinking that God's going to hand us the big thing. And when he does, it's going to be glorious. And God says you're ineligible for the big things until you cut 150 pieces of paper or until you sweep the floor. Or until you, you see what I'm saying? I'm not talking about the magnanimous stuff because we don't have time to get to the magnanimous stuff and we can't even say nice things to our wife. Does that make sense? So what was the last thing that he told you, prompted you, inspired you, convicted you, led you to do that you thought was so beneath you that you allowed the enemy to convince you to dismiss it when all God was doing was setting the wiffle ball up on the tee so you could swing and hit it. He was literally trying to set you up for an easy blessing. What was it? For those of you that have caught any portion of this online, I celebrate the fact that we got connected in this way. If you're looking for a church home, we would love to include you in the family. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. And so until our next appointed time, God bless you. And have an incredible day.